Okay, welcome everyone to another edition of Talking Away the Taboo. And tonight we are actually going to be really, I mean, we always talk away the taboo, but we are really talking away the taboo right now because we're gonna be talking about cancer. And cancer is a word that many people can't even say out loud. Some people only use the Hebrew word machla. Some people whisper it. They, they, they don't even want to give it credence, to give it life because they're so worried that just talking about it might make it actually happen. But it does happen. And it happens anytime during life. And it can also happen during your fertility year. Okay, and it also can happen during your fertility years. And so we are here tonight to bring on an, an absolutely incredible woman who is going to be sharing her story. Her name is Abby Brody. She lives in the Florida area, and this is the second time that she has shared her story. She, uh, let me just grab her just to make sure that she is here. I do see her, one second. One second, she's telling me that. Make sure that she's she's here. I know she's here. Ah, here we go. Um, okay, she's coming. There we go. Okay, great. Abby, I'm so happy to have you here. Let me just finish the introduction and then we're gonna get right started. Get get started. Um, Abby is someone and she's gonna share her story with you tonight. Abby is someone who lives in the Florida area. This is the second time that she is sharing her story now with a wider audience. She only shared it locally prior to this. And she actually approached me. I want to be very clear about this. This was not something that I was reaching out, trying to find people to talk about, even though I should have. Let's be clear. I should have. But Abby approached me and said, hey, I need to do this. I want to do this because I know there are people out there that are struggling and I've been there and I can help. And so Abby, I'm turning it over to you. Introduce yourself, please. Hi everyone. Um, I'm so honored to be on this live. Um, this organization is very near and dear to my heart and I'm really passionate about everything that you're doing. And um, so I'm really honored to be here. Um, yes, cancer can be a really, really tough um, subject to discuss, but it is my lived experience. So um, I really you know, want to be able to come on here um, and talk about it because nobody wants to feel like they're alone. So if I can touch someone else that you know, goes through something even remotely similar to what I went through, um, then I will have you know, met my goal in sharing my story. Um, so at the age of 33 years old, I went to a new OBGYN, new to me, um, just, you know, trying to, um, conceive. I think I'd already have, um, three amazing, um, boys and, um, going to this new OBGYN, um, he went through a very, very thorough, um, medical history. And upon me telling him that this was actually exactly a year ago, I just um, celebrated my my one year cancer anniversary this weekend. Amazing. Um, so amazing. Um, a lot has changed in the last year, which we'll talk about. Um, but at age 33, um, my new OBGYN, Dr. David Lubeckin, he's located here in Boca. Um, he encouraged me because my my mother had breast cancer to have genetic testing done. Um, as well as go for my first mammogram. In general, mammograms are not actually recommended until um, age 40, um, aside from if there is you know, a, a family history or something suspected. So um, meanwhile, um, later on, I had found out that once the genetic testing came back, actually after I was diagnosed, um, there were actually no genetic um, mutations that were found in my testing, um, which I later learned is because if they're testing for, let's say, 50 genetic mutations, um, my genetic connection to my mother's cancer, whatever that mutation would have been, um, was actually, you know, let's say number 51 or 52 that they just have not 
learned to test for yet. Um, but it didn't matter because obviously, you know, I ended up having the cancer. I went for um, an initial mammogram. And um, during the mammogram, they had mentioned to me that because of my age, being so young, that I actually had very dense breast tissue, which now I understand is very common amongst young women um, having their first mammogram. And so, sorry, there's literal banging on my okay. on my door right now <laughs> just make things more fun and interesting okay. um so um so you know at the time having the um the ultrasound um i i figured it, it was really just part of the general routine mammogram ultrasound it wasn't until during the ultrasound that i realized that um the ultrasound tech kind of stopped um talking and was really focusing in on one spot i started to feel a little a little bit of panic um but i said yeah, I'm, I'm sure this is just part of whatever they're doing when the doctor came in was when i knew obviously that there was a problem they wanted me to leave and come back the same day um for a biopsy so i had um like a needle biopsy um on that same day that was um friday by tuesday which was rosh chodesh adzar um, I got the phone call that um, it was indeed cancer, but my doctor, um, the radiologist, um, had you know reassured me it's very small, it's very early, it's very treatable. Thank God you, you know, came when you did. Um, and so you know, from there, you're sort of just thrust into this whole new world of navigating. You don't even know where to go. Um, so the first thing that I did was um, I was told to schedule an appointment with a breast surgeon. Um, and you know, it was, it was definitely a challenge because I didn't know anyone in my age bracket. You know, usually you ask friends, neighbors, oh, you know, which doctor do you go to? I'm looking for a dermatologist. I'm looking for a podiatrist. This was something that A, I wanted to keep private at the time and B, no one I knew had ever gone to a breast surgeon before. So who was I even going to for a recommendation? Um, sure enough, I did find um, Dr. Hillary Shapiro Wright. She was my surgeon at um, Boca Regional. What I loved about her work is that she works with a team. So you go to what's called a multimodality clinic um, and you sit down with the breast surgeon, the oncologist, the radiation oncologist. They review you know, your whole case and they help come up with the treatment plan. So when you have a breast biopsy, what they give you um, with the results, obviously you know, benign or, or cancerous, um, they also give you what's called receptor status. So what your receptor status means is what hormones are feeding your cancer. So there are three things that they're looking for. It's estrogen, progesterone, um, and a gene, I guess, mutation called HER2. Um, and so what I knew at the time was that my results came back estrogen and progesterone positive, which means that cancer is being fed by all of the estrogen and progesterone that my body would be naturally producing, um, as well as, let's say, from birth control, which, you know, women in our in our 30s, for different reasons, at one point or another, may have, you know, had um, these hormones. So, um, so those were positive, and the HER2 gene um, was borderline. So they had sent it out for retesting. In the time that I was waiting for these test results. Hold on, yeah. hold on. I, I just want to stop stop for a second. Sure. Why those things are important, I'm guessing, because those those specific markers would indicate what kind of treatment you would have. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Yes, I apologize that I left Okay, that. no, no. No problem. And I also just wanted to stop also just for a second and pause. If anybody has any questions at all, you can either drop them in the comments. I'm trying to keep up with the comments or you can specifically send private messages here within the live and I will take a look at them and we'll try to answer them as we're talking. Okay, Abby, go ahead. Right. So, um, so the estrogen, progesterone and HER2 would essentially um, determine my treatment plan. So the first step that was decided to do was a lumpectomy, which means that they only re um, remove the tumor and itself and they biopsy the lymph node, um, which is like in your armpit to see if the cancer has spread or not. I was extremely lucky that um, my cancer was um, very, very localized. It was in one spot, one tumor. It did end up being bigger than what they initially thought it actually was from the biopsy. 
Um, but nevertheless, there was no lymph node involvement, which makes, which also makes a difference in your treatment plan because you know that it's just in the breast. It has not traveled anywhere else into metastatic disease. Thank God. Thank God. Um, and so and hold on, J just to be clear, you were not found to be BRCA positive. This was a different, totally different, different gene Correct. than was, was because you said that they tested for 50 some odd genes and you did not come up and one of the, you did not come up as positive for any of those. And one of those was BRCA. Correct. So I knew already just from asking my mother, if she had told me that she had tested and that she was BRCA one and two negative. Um, but I wouldn't have even necessarily known until now that I'm so deep in this world that genetic testing is so important to just, to just know your risk, know your lifetime risk in advance. Um, because had I not thought about my predisposition and gone for a mammogram exactly at the time that I did, um, my situation would look very different. And I was even told that my the characteristics of my tumor were extremely aggressive with a, a high chance um, of, of spreading. So, um, you know, again, the whole time, I'm just very, very grateful for every step in the process. Okay, but, so, but, but Abby, just to, just to like circle back to this, this is not Charchere. We are a fertility organization and we're having this discussion about breast cancer specifically because of all of the other pieces in regard to you trying to build your family. Correct. So take us back. So, so now give us the rest of the pieces. Right. So um, the next part was that I was scheduled for surgery, but about a week before my surgery was when um, I started to um, experience pregnancy symptoms. And at that point they had already told me, um, you know, to be sure to be using um, non-hormonal birth control, but that after my surgery, I would have um, a non-hormonal IUD placed um, because you can't have something in your body that's giving hormones if your cancer is being fed off of those hormones. Um, and so I started to experience pregnancy symptoms about a week before my surgery was scheduled. And I had this moment of sheer panic and confusion because it was obviously something that I wanted. I, that's how the whole thing started was I literally, like the line says, I was supposed to have a baby. I was just a regular person going to my OBGYN and to have my IUD removed and, and, you know, to try and conceive for number four. Um, and this is how this whole thing started. So when I started having pregnancy symptoms, um, I called my oncologist and I called the surgeon and basically the surgery was placed on hold. So um, I had to go to the OB and basically wait to see what would be happening, you know, with this, with this pregnancy. Um, unfortunately, it did not develop. And I was basically told that I would sort of wait to miscarry, which was such an anxiety inducing experience while I'm also looking at um, the surgery and even also just getting back to those test results, this HER2 gene that they had tested for, the test results got lost, literally lost somewhere in California. It was a crazy lab mix up. And those test results were going to basically determine not only at this point, my treatment plan, but whether I would be able to keep this pregnancy or not. So I was kind of just told like, either the pregnancy is going to develop or you might have to terminate, or it might not develop into anything at all. So just the angst and the, the um, dealing with a, a cancer diagnosis by itself, and now also experiencing, and I had never had a miscarriage before. So, you know, I think at any stage, somebody goes through this tremendous amount of grief um, from losing a pregnancy, but to also be dealing with the cancer end was just think about too much my head is in circles um because it's just for one person um to go through so um hold that hold being on, said hold on, yes hold on one second abby you just broke up for a second just give us that last line again just about how all of these things together you were saying something and i just the sound was a little bit off oh sure no i was just saying all of these things together it's just it's it's too much for one person to to deal with you know you, you can't even grieve one thing when you have something else going on and you're, you're 
just drowning in, you know, fighting for life, basically. Of course. Of yeah. course. I, I can't even, and, and then like the idea of thinking that you might have to terminate a very wanted pregnancy and then thinking about your own life. I, I mean, I can't, I, I can't even, I, and yet like the decision was made for you. Right. So what ended up happening was I, I did miscarry and they, after having moved my surgery back, they ended up moving it back fo forward and they did a lumpectomy and a DNC um, on the same day, one doctor after another. Wow. From those, from the final biopsy, when they removed the tumor, they, they did find that it was HER2 positive, which meant that had I not actually miscarried, I would have been told to terminate the pregnancy. So I really, yes. as difficult as it is, I look at it as it, it was a bracha. Hashem made it that I did not have to make an impossible decision. Um, and had, you know, after speaking to my oncologist and my surgeon throughout this whole process and them seeing how devastated I was, um, about, you know, losing this pregnancy and, and meanwhile, that's all I wanted. Um, they were very sympathetic to my cause and they encouraged me to go through fertility preservation before starting, um, my cancer treatments. So here I was dealing with the cancer, but also stepping into this world of, um, you know, being in the fertility treatments and um, even just to get to that point, working with organizations. Um, I called A Time, I called Boney Olam, um, I called PUA, and all of these organizations were so grateful to have them because no one goes into this situation, you know, thinking like, oh, I, I, I know what to do. I, I got this. It's, it's a very um, scary, unknown um, territory. I also, something that I struggled with is that the fact that I still want children, um, more children, and right now I'm being told, you know, by Hashem, but, by, but also by my doctors, you know, right now is not, um, you know, going to be the right time. Um, I, I almost felt like a fraud sometimes sitting in, in the fertility clinic because here I am with, with three kids at home, but I, I, I realized that every, every child is a wanted child and it doesn't matter, um, you know, if you have three, four five already at home, if you're yearning for that next one and, and for whatever reason, it's not happening, whether it's cancer related, whether it's otherwise, um, it's, it's very it's extremely painful and just, you know, you're dealing with this new medical terminology and all of these things. And, um, that whole chapter of my story was, was really a tremendous challenge. Um, thank God I was able to, um, preserve three embryos, which is, um, a real bracha, just that it was, you know, that that process was successful. Um, but, but I am also on medication that um, prevents me from being able to do a transfer for the next few years. So, you know, and, and all of that is also just dependent on my health in the meantime and, you know, really closely monitoring, um, you know, to make sure that there's no cancer recurrence, God forbid. Um, but I'm, I'm still, you know, the day to day, now that things with my treatment have sort of you know, quieted down and I only, you know, take a daily medication. I go in every three weeks for an infusion still um, until June. Um, but just the day to day now, I, I am finding that it is hard to, um, to be around, you know, certain conversations and, and be around, you know, well, well intended people who might say, oh, you know, you have three boys. When are you trying for the girl? It, I mean, if I had a dollar for every time that somebody said something insensitive, I, I would be a very, very rich person. Um, and um, so I, I really, I feel that. I, I feel that on a, on a daily basis. And there's a lot of reminders out there that, you know, that this is my situation right now. Um, and it's very painful. Um, but I, hopefully, please God, I'll be able to use those embryos in the future. I mean, I mean, Abby, how, how do you, how do you answer when someone says something like that to you? I, I, and I'm asking for, you know, everyone out there who is dealing with like specifically, like you're in the position of secondary infertility for circumstantial reasons. It's not that you can't get pregnant and, and, you know, egg and sperm are not able to meet. They are, but because of what you're dealing with in terms of your cancer diagnosis, but there are 
thousands, millions, however many people out there that are also struggling with not being able to get pregnant for a million reasons, or who can't for whatever those reasons are, and still those comments come. What do you say? What have you been saying? What does it depend on? Depending on like, what do you say, depending on who's saying it or what the circumstances are? It's, it's a really good question. It definitely depends on my mood and depends on the context. Like, I, I would love to be able to say I had the courage to like whip out some really like witty lines to kind of like put someone in, in perspective. Um, there was once like at the grocery store where like I, I was in Walmart and like I was with my kids and and um, I knew that I was never going to see this person again. So I was like, I told them straight out. I was like, oh, well, I have cancer, so I can't have any more kids right now. And he, poor guy, he was like, I, you can bet like he's never going to say that to somebody ever again. Um, but even, even in our, you know, shtetl, there are people who, who forget and, and, you know, will say things and, um, you know, I, for, for the most part, I, I'm kind of quiet because I don't want to embarrass somebody, but at the same time, I would love to be able to, you know, really say to people, you know, like right now it's not so simple or please God one day, you know, when I'm able to, um, but I, I have a new found sensitivity because I, I think back and I wonder before I was in this world, maybe I, maybe I wasn't so sensitive and maybe I did say things to other people totally not realizing or making a comment or asking or even not out loud, but even just thinking to myself like, oh, they have, you know, I, I, I would be wrong if I, if I said that I never was curious about someone else's, but um, I, it's, um, it, it's very, it, it's really, really hard to find the right words sometimes. Talking about your kids, because you mentioned them that you were in Walmart with them. How, how did you handle that? The discussion with them, one about cancer and two about, I am sure they also feel like, oh, everybody else is having another, or when are we going to have a sister? Like, how, how did you manage, or, or do you manage both of those conversations with them? Right. So it's interesting. It's never really come up in like a conversational type of way. My four-year-old will sometimes say like, I want a baby, or he'll like poke at my belly and say, oh, is there a baby? And I'm like, mm, no, not right now. Um, so I really have not gotten it gotten into it with them in like a conversation they've never really asked so deeply but um on the rare occasions when something like sort of comes up my husband and I both just say like please God in the right time you know we we, we are hoping for that and we would love for that to happen um but right now is just not the right time for us um they do know that I had cancer um but it's not um you know thank God we're just we're just living. We're just trying to, um, to do our thing now. And, and, you know, my kids do see that now that the bulk of my like real treatment is over, um, things are really starting to get, you know, back to normal, um, whatever normal right. means. Right. Um, so, you know, that's where, that's where I sort of am with them, but I imagine that as they get older, they're going to have a new awareness of, you know, what our family dynamics are and, and, you know, why, we don't have as many children in our family as maybe some of their, their friends do. Um, so I'm sure that at the time I will need to come up with an age appropriate um, response. Abby, you are, I mean, having this conversation with you and, and when you and I spoke earlier, you just are this like epitome of strength of someone who can almost, it feels, feels like could go through anything, that anything could happen and you would be able to take it and sort of roll with it and just like keep, 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 keep your strength, keep your amuna, keep your bitachon, like keep your faith in God. Like we're, can you just talk about like the moments when things, like when you initially got the diagnosis and or different points in the journey, like what are the, what were the lowest points for you? Where, where did you falter? What, where was their grief? When did that come and how did you overcome it? How the person I'm seeing now may not have been, I don't know because you and I just met recently, but may not have been the person who you were in the initial stages of this. Can you just talk us through a little bit of your emotional inner life and your 
like your relationship to God, to Hashem, and like how that has has changed or hasn't, or maybe it hasn't. Right. So um, in the beginning, it was really a roller coaster. Like I, I had some really high highs and some really low lows. Um, I think that in the beginning, when you're just gathering all of the information and you're dealing with a lot of just medical terminology and I was also dealing with like insurance issues and trying to find the right providers and just trying to deal with the logistics that um, there were a lot of moments where I didn't have time to process. Like I just had to keep going. Um, there was like a time when I went for an MRI. I, I had to have two MRIs. The first one, they ended up finding something in the other breast. So they sent me back in for um, a second MRI with a biopsy in the MRI machine, which is about as fun as it sounds. Um, and I was so, going to say, I'm like, oh God. Yeah. I, can't. yeah. I, I learned better the second time to like take something to calm myself before. Um, but I remember that the difference between those, those first, the first MRI, I went in and I, I had this moment where I just, I was really panicked and I was really um, just like sobbing. And obviously you're in an MRI machine, so you're not allowed to move, but I just remember sobbing and you're, you're sitting face down, right? So you're crying and your nose starts running. And it was just a, a very, very emotional time because I was alone. You know, you're really mamish alone. You can't bring your husband, your mother, you know, you're, it, it's just you. Um, and what changed for me was that the second MRI that I went for, um, I remember going into the machine and saying, it's either like they found something, right? So it's either cancer or it's not. And nothing that I do right now is going to change that. Hashem has decided already what this is. Um, if there's more, if there's less, whatever the case is. And I think that I had this really surreal moment of just like surrender. Like I had been trying for like a, a month to just make sure that all of my ducks were in a row and make sure that I had like control over the situation, staying on top of the appointments and making the phone calls. And it just really got to a point where I was just like, this really is not in my control. So just tell me what I need to do. Tell me where I need to go and when. And I just was like this. I don't know how people go through something like this without a support system. Um, I actually like made a, a Suda's Hoda um, last night and explain, um, explain uh, what that is. Sure. Like just um, a public, and this is part of it also is like just a public acknowledgement to God that um, I have no evidence of disease after a year and that I'm just so grateful that my prognosis was so positive and that I was able to be treated. Not everyone has the ability by the time their cancer is found, not everyone has the ability to go through successful treatment. So I, I really don't take that for granted. Um, and so, you know, that being said, when I'm thanking God, but I'm also really thanking the people that got me through, whether it was just, you know, I, I had a friend, I have a friend, sorry, that works in the IVF world. And so there's no doubt that Hashem put her like in, in this position with me that she was able to handhold me throughout the whole process she would come to my house and help me with my shots at night so that it was just one last thing that I needed to worry about um and so all of the people from the people who just you know dropped off groceries and Shabbos high lifeline taking my kids when I needed them to um neighbors just you know giving my kids a ride home and taking them out for a little bit on Sunday it takes a village and and this was my village so when I'm you know thanking God I'm thanking God for all of it. And, and that was just a, a huge part of it. Um, so, yeah. I, I mean, it is, it is tremendous. It is tremendous. And thank, thank you. God. I, I just, I want to add one other thing that um, just in terms of my, my um, way of processing the whole thing, I, I keep telling people that I think that the biggest thing that I walked away with um, from just the whole cancer process in general is that um I find that it takes a lot to get me upset these days. Like, I don't get frustrated anymore sitting in traffic. I don't get frustrated anymore waiting online. I don't get frustrated, like just little things. They, it just doesn't bother me anymore. And I feel bad when, when I see other people getting themselves worked up over what I perceive now as being nonsense. And I really dive in, I pray every day that I'll be able to hold on to that forever. Cause the reality is you could forget very fast. 
Um, but I think that, you know, when you have your health, that's everything. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, and I would just, I would be remiss if I didn't come on here and, and also just explain and, and just give suggestions since we are, yep. you know, go, going into a week, you know, where we're talking about cancer and fertility um, is I really just want to stress to people who are listening, the power of genetic testing. Speak to your OBGYN about getting genetic testing, because even if you do not have immediate family history of breast or ovarian cancer, it is very prevalent in the Jewish community for women. Um, and thank God we have resources such as Shasharet is the Jewish um, organization for women, um, you know, fighting against breast and ovarian cancer, but they'll give you the information that you need. Um, genetic testing is huge, as is um, early screening. And just, you know, again, just knowing your risk factors. Um, I know that there is also a lot of information out there regarding um, if you get genetic testing, and if you find out, let's say that you do have a certain gene that makes you predis uh, disposed, gives you a predis right predisposed to having um, you know one of these um, hereditary cancers. That there are things that you can do in the fertility realm to make sure that a that you're you know preserving what you have, um, so that God forbid you know you do get something down the line. Um, that you have, you know, the eggs or the embryos or, or whatever it is. But I believe that there's also things that they can do in terms of the actual embryos themselves in terms of testing for the um, genetic mutation. So um, again, Sharsharet is huge. Um, Bone Olam was, was really um, a tremendous research for me as well um, throughout the process, um, as was Livestrong actually as a cancer organization. And they also um, provide a lot of resources um, and um, financial support for women um, going through fertility treatments specifically related to cancer. Um, and so that was something that was really helpful as well. I, I, you know, it is, it is amazing that we have all of these incredible organizations out there, but I, I, I want to just plug one more thing. Um, just what you were saying, early detection, we as women, we have the ability to get mammograms. They're terrible. They're awful. They're the worst ever. They're painful. They're they're annoying. They're yes, 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 and yes. But yes, they exist to help us to be able to find things that we can't feel on our own. That's why Correct. these things exist. They told me actually during during my mammog like after I was diagnosed, they said that due to the location and the size of this tumor, it would have taken a very, very long time for me to actually be able to feel it. And so how much more so we have to be on top of getting our screenings because um, thank God it didn't get bigger. Thank God, thank God. Yeah. Um, Abby, I wanna go back to something that you said earlier about how when you were in the MRI machine and you were about to get this biopsy or, or second, second MRI and you like felt yourself getting anxious and you like you kind of said it as a throwaway line where you said like you know I, I the second time I did it I remembered I should take something so that it would make me less anxious like you th said it as a th throwaway line but I I, I want to just bring that point out here can you talk more about that and the there are, there is also as much as we don't talk about cancer we also don't talk about medication to help us with any issues regarding mental health so can you just speak about that piece sure. So um, I contacted um, my psychiatrist and, and basically just said, like, I need something that's going to be able to get me through. And, you know, he did prescribe something. And I, I told him, I said, we're not talking about just like a low level and everyday like anxiety. We're talking about, you know, I'm nervous that I'm going to go into an MRI machine and have a panic attack. Um, and I, 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 first of all, I can't imagine going through any kind of MRI after that without taking anything because if you're a person that is afraid of like small spaces or it makes you uncomfortable in any way, why should you be without help? So, um, you know, for me, that was huge. Um, and again, like I think just throughout the process, knowing that I had something that I could take um, when I needed to it's, you know, I still go for therapy. I, I have a therapist that I, you know, work with, you know, every other week to just 
get through some of the daily stressors of even from before cancer. So um, I was always a person that really, you know, valued that. Um, but even more so now keeping up with the therapy as a way of um, like productive venting, I guess you would say. Um, but in terms of the psychiatry realm, just knowing that there are aids out there that are specifically meant for people who are going through an emotional trauma or like a major stress in their life. There's no reason not to have that if it's available. A thousand, thousand, thousand percent. It's what we talk about all the time here. There is absolutely no reason for anybody to suffer, for anybody to struggle. Um, okay, as we're wrapping up here, can you share... You know, we we often talk about here this idea that when people are going through things that, you know, people always say, like, I don't know what to do and I don't know what to say and I don't know what to bring. And I like and, and you know, we have these general like we as Jews, we bring food because that's all we know how to do well. Like we do food very well. But can you just talk about the things through this journey that have been the most meaningful for you that have helped you out the most? Like you mentioned, you know, taking your kids and doing that, but the things that were most meaningful for you that helped you, that let you know that people out there cared about you. And to be able also just to give ideas to people who are in general struggling with cancer or with grief, with infertility, whatever it is, just to give ideas. What, what were the things that really just like warmed your heart? So I think that the biggest thing for me that I found most helpful is when people don't ask, they just do. So, you know, asking me like, you know, if, if I need something, I'm probably going to say no. But if you brought me something, I'm not going to say no. Um, and so, you know, I found it super meaningful. Um, like one or two of my friends, I was also, I want to just add that I was very, very private when this was going on. Like very, very few people knew what I was going through. It was only afterwards that I decided that keeping this to myself was not helping anyone. Um, I want women to know that women are being diagnosed with breast cancer younger and younger. Um, and there's a lot of information out there and I want to help get it out. Um, that being said, one or two of my friends that did know, they put together little care packages specifically for, let's say, treatment day. So um, a swaddle me blanket and like aromatherapy things and just things that they felt, a water bottle, things that, you know, that they felt would just make me more warm and cozy. There's, is, there is also um, an incredible support group um, called Wonder Women. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it, but um, it is not related to Sharsheret, although the women on the Wonder Women chat are also all involved in Sharsheret related things and have benefited from the amazing work of Sharsheret. But it's basically a WhatsApp group for Jewish women diagnosed with breast cancer, like specifically around or under age 40, which is a very, very specific niche of, of people. It's a very specific demographic. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I had, you know, one or two people that were like, oh, you should talk to this person. She also had breast cancer. I'm like, but my challenges are not the same as a 60 year old woman experiencing breast cancer. And I don't want to minimize at all what that person is going through. But at the same time, I did experience the infertility piece is only something that women are, are going to be able to relate to who have, have been there or are thinking about it or who have experienced it. Um, so that being said, you know, now I, I want to get it out there. But again, I think when anybody is going through anything, I think the best thing is to just follow your instincts and, and just check on the person. I love that, you know, I have friends that will still just reach out to me, even, you know, today, hi, I'm thinking of you. How are you doing? You know, and, and giving me the space to be able to say, it's not a great day, but thanks for asking, because I don't, I don't want to have to feel like I always have to be like, okay, for other people, because it might make them uncomfortable if I, if I'm honest, and I say that I'm not okay. So checking in, making specific offers is also huge. And I think that this goes for, you know, again, like you said, cancer, grief, infertility, any of the above, when you know that somebody close to you is going through a hard time, tell them I'm going to Trader Joe's, I know that you love this, and this snack, what else can I get for you? Don't ask them cat, oh, I can go grocery shopping for you anytime. Just do it. The person is not going to decline. Um, so I, I found those things to be super meaningful. 
And anything in specific, you know, for the husbands out there, for the partners out there, what what do you recommend for them? What did your, I mean, I know this is alive with you and not with your husband, but if you could speak for him or, and, or, and or give suggestions from his standpoint as he was going through everything, what what would you say? What would you say for the people out there that are trying to support or how to deal with just like being being not the person who's going through it, but yet like scared and overwhelmed with everything? Right. So I, it's a great question. I think that it's really, really hard for the caregivers to watch someone else, you know, be in pain emotionally, physically. Um, and I think that they really need just as much support, but they're not always thought of the same way. So I think that, you know, if let's say you're a friend, a neighbor, a relative, and you're trying to figure out what you can do, you, you want to make sure that you're not only thinking about the person going through it themselves, but also the spouse and the children. You know, I, I really also value the people who, you know, maybe took my husband out for a night and just, you know, took him out to dinner just to have some relief. Um, the people who offered to take my kids, you know, on, on treatment days or on Sundays or Shabbos play dates, things like that. Um, but I think that, you know, looking back, it was really a challenge for my husband to to watch me when I was like really in, like in pain, you know, even, you know, surgery fine, but like chemo and, and the after effects um, and the fertility treatments as well. I think that, you know, I, out of everything, if I'm honest, I think that the fertility treatments were the hardest part of this for me. I mean, I, I thank God my body was strong and I've been poked and prodded so many times, but like radiation, I really was fine. I was tired chemo, I really didn't have the nausea, but like the fertility took a tremendous toll and um, having him watch that where like my process was so much more complicated than his process. Um, I think that just looking back, like that must have been a real challenge. So just, you know, trying to support the husbands and just recognizing because, you know, at the end of the day, you can only do you can only do with what you have. So it's very hard to get a real window into someone else's feelings, but just offering your support and, you know, the same as you would offer to the, to the patient, you want to just make those specific, you know, um, offers for help is, is huge. Amazing. Abby, I, I cannot thank you enough thank you. for reaching out, for sharing your heart, sharing your story, sharing pieces of your emotions that maybe you haven't even shared before. Um, is there anything else that you want to tell everyone as you have this captive audience as yeah. you're saying goodbye? Yeah, I would just encourage anybody. I, you know, I really want to be a resource for people. So, you know, aside from the incredible organizations that we have, you first have to know what the resources are. So, um, if anybody wants to, you know, reach out to me directly to ask me, you know, more questions, um, I am more than happy if you want to direct message me, um, any of that, you, you know, more than welcome to, and, um, you know, we'll get through it together. So thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you for everybody. I'm like so honored that people want to hear what I have to say. So that's like very humbling. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, we are going to put links to the different organizations that Abby mentioned here. And also when this conversation also go, goes up on our podcast, um, we'll have links there. And if you want to reach out to Abby and not through Instagram, if you want her email address, just message us and we can give you her email address as well. Abby, Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank I you. I remember so much. you started this off and the conversation also that we had initially was, I just want to help anyone out there, even if it's just one person. And I told this to you earlier, right after I put up the notice that you were speaking, already we had someone reach out. So even if it's, I know it's going to be for more than that person, but even if it was just for her, you have already helped people feel less alone. And you have, you have absolutely 1000%. There are people out there that have not scheduled their mammograms and now you're going to do it, right? Everybody, you're going to schedule your mammograms <laughs> yeah. because you've now heard this story. Please do that. Thank you, Abby, so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night.